Gregory Jarvis, age 41, was a Hughes aircraft engineer on board Challenger to conduct tests on the effect of weightlessness on liquids carried in tanks. NASA hoped his experiments would provide information for the design of liquid fuel rockets. He was born in Detroit and trained as an Air Force satellite engineer. He was married but had no children. Mission specialist Ronald McNair was doing research on lasers when he was selected to become an astronaut in 1978. Born in Lake City, South Carolina, schooled at MIT, he brought a background in physics to the shuttle program. This was his second flight. A husband and father, McNair saw space travel as a calling for himself and mankind. So I see it as something that we must do, and I see it as something that's part of man's nature to explore. And finally, the first teacher in space, Krista McAuliffe, chosen for more than 11,000 applicants for what she described as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Well, it was a challenge, and it was something that I always ask my students, you know, to go and seek whatever they feel they can do and reach a little higher. McAuliffe taught social studies in Concord, New Hampshire, and she said she wanted to bring the wonder of space to students all across the country. She'd planned to give lessons on weightlessness and life in outer space that were to be televised to millions of schoolrooms. She survived by her husband, her two children, and all the students she taught and adored in Concord. She did this to, to get people into the space program, you know, to open up people's eyes and get people more enthusiastic about it. And I know that she will hope that people take this as a bad accident, as bad accidents to occur, and just to have faith. In the end, faith is what America's space program began and grew up with, that and technology. Today, whatever it was that went wrong, it wasn't a problem of faith. Stone Phillips, ABC News. The seven men and women who flew on Challenger this morning, in some cases having flown before, and reminding us, of course, that the success of the space program has been such over the last few years. This was the 10th mission of Challenger and the 25th of the shuttle program that we have come to take its success and its safety very much for granted until today. I suppose the reminder there is that we now identify with those men and women in a much more personal way uh, than we have done almost at any point since the beginning of the space shuttle program with the exception of a woman flying for the first time or in the case of the first black astronaut in space. One of the things that people have said fairly regularly today is that we've become rather blasé uh, about the success of the manned space program. On the other hand, people have tended to to refer on more than one occasion to the way people chivied away at NASA because both Columbia and Challenger have spent additional time on the ground when they were supposed to be launched because of minor uh, and sometimes not so minor problems. Uh, there's no question that both Columbia and Challenger, Challenger is the issue here today, was something of a troubled spacecraft. Does not suggest by any means a uh, reflection uh, on what happened today, but it was on occasion a troubled spacecraft. Here's John McQuethy. When they built this billion-and-a-half-dollar spacecraft, they projected that it would be flying for at least a decade, part of a fleet of space shuttles that would be roaring into orbit every few weeks. Challenger was on its tenth flight today and just its third year of service. Like its sister ships, Columbia, Discovery, and Atlantis, Challenger has suffered through some crippling technical problems over the years, but has also repeatedly written itself into the history books with its many successful firsts. It was aboard Challenger that Sally Ride, the first female astronaut, made her maiden voyage into space. Guyan Bluford became the first American black in space. His ship was Challenger. The spacecraft was used for the first space walk from a shuttle in 1983, and a year later it proved for the first time that shuttle could indeed capture a satellite, repair it, and send it back into orbit. But Challenger has also been shadowed by problems. Its first launch in 1983 was delayed for two and a half months because of an engine leak. In one 1984 mission, the Challenger crew lost three satellites while trying to launch them into orbit. Malfunctions later blamed on the satellites, not on Challenger. In December of 1984, NASA had to scrub Challenger's next mission. It was supposed to carry the military's first secret payload into space. Challenger's protective heat shield had been badly damaged, and the ship had to go in for an extensive overhaul. Last July was probably Challenger's worst month until today. Three seconds before its scheduled liftoff, the countdown was stopped because of a coolant leak. We have an RSLS abort. We have an abort. Later that same month, Challenger came perilously close to disaster when it suffered what NASA called a launch emergency. One of its engines shut down while a spacecraft was climbing into orbit. The crew scrambled to jettison excess weight, 
but they could never get Challenger up to its full orbit. Challenger was supposed to fly five missions this year. One of them was to be a secret military payload, taking it into orbit. The military, in fact, has been so concerned about the reliability of Challenger that it has insisted that NASA fly at least two military payloads a year the old-fashioned way atop expendable rockets. That was a hedge in case the Challenger and all of the other space shuttles proved that they could not do as promised. Peter? John, thank you very much for joining us. In fact, on the four shuttles, there were 15 missions planned for 1986, both in the commercial field and the military field. Uh, this was to be a very ambitious year for the space shuttle. And as John McCreffy points out, um, and as others have pointed out, this is an enormous setback, not only for the commercial competition, uh, but also for the military program, which the United States had been using the shuttle for. This message from your local stations. Try to give you some indication of how the news today hit Washington like a thunderbolt. A number of us reporters were at the White House this morning waiting to see President Reagan, who usually on the morning of a State of the Union address calls in reporters from around the country, the networks and the newspapers and the wire services, to talk about his State of the Union message. And in the middle of that meeting, as we waited for the president to come into the dining room, uh, a message was handed in the door to Don Regan, the chief of staff, saying uh, the shuttle has exploded, details to follow. We all fled from the room, obviously. And shortly thereafter, as some of you may know, the president canceled, postponed his State of the Union message, which will now be given a week from today. And the White House and Congress, but the White House particularly, has just felt the burden of this national tragedy um, very deeply. Here's our White House correspondent, Sam Donaldson. The flags went down to half-staff all over Washington as the shock set in, from the White House to Capitol Hill. This is truly a national loss. Well, it's very difficult for me to talk about it because these were my friends. The House of Representatives paused for a moment of silent prayer, and elected officials tried to make sense of what had happened. I think everyone that's ever had any connection with the program has felt that someday there would be a a loss in flight. Uh, we're dealing with tremendous powers and speeds. You're traveling in orbit at five miles a second and trying to get back into the atmosphere from that kind of speed. And so uh, are we going to be perfect forever? I guess the answer was proven this morning that the answer to that is no. God moves in mysterious ways. I guess from time to time to remind us of what mortal beings we really are and that we Everything isn't all that sure. The Washington Day began on a note of pleasant expectation. The president would give his State of the Union message tonight, and his mood as he briefed congressional leaders on it was clearly upbeat. Now that the Super Bowl is over, I can really say, welcome back. And Tip, I suspect the results were not all that you would have liked. It was like the first year of your term, Mr. <laughs> But at 11.40, when the president received the news, the upbeat mood changed. Mr. Reagan watched the television replays horrified. He told reporters he was shocked and saddened, but that the State of the Union speech would go on. You can't stop governing the nation, he said. But within an hour, that had changed. The pictures were too horrible. The shocked reactions from families and school children too emotional. The president feels that these same emotions are being experienced by people all over this nation at this moment. Uh, and with the con consultation of Congress that's taken place in the last hour or so, the president thought it was entirely appropriate that uh, his State of the Union uh, be deferred. So the speech was postponed until next Tuesday night, leaving time for reflection and also the first assessments of the space program's future. Well, it's going to have an adverse uh, impact upon the whole space program. Uh, there may be delays that can uh, go on for, for as much as a year with regard to future uh, shuttle launches. They were under tremendous pressure, especially in this very, very busy year. And I think that NASA was under uh, pressure from its uh, uh, commercial customers uh, to deliver and to deliver on time. I think that some limit has to be placed on the PR that NASA indulges in before they uh, proceed with their launch. I'm not uh, opposed to a, an occasional civilian, but it seemed to me there ought to be some educational or some scientific uh, purpose in their journey 